Hi, my name is Ken Gosnell. I'm the CEO and founder of CEO Experience, a consulting firm that helps Christian CEOs hear the words well done by using biblical business principles, applying it to their business for growth and kingdom impact. I'm also author of the book, Well Done. And today I get the honor of hosting a well done CEO named Daniel Ra. Daniel is the founder and owner and CEO of Red Alpha Technologies, a technology firm that's based in the Washington DC area that primarily works with government agencies to help them secure their data and protect them uh, information from cyber attacks. Daniel, welcome to CEO Experience and the CEO Conversation. I'm delighted to have you here. Now, Daniel, uh, I usually like to start these conversations by talking about how important it is in the startup phase. And you've had quite a success. You just are getting ready to celebrate your 10 year anniversary. And, uh, but you uh, started your business uh, and have an amazing startup story. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got started and your entrepreneurial journey to success? It's my dad, right? So he was one of Korea's top software engineers. Uh, but he sacrificed comfort and riches um, in his motherland to create a better place for his children. And so I carry that theme into the mission and vision of Red Alpha. Um, and it becomes a part of why I started Red Alpha. Now I'm a father of four. Uh, I have one mini mom and uh, three boys. I'm married to Helen Ra, who's an amazing mother of five children. You do the math there. <laughs> um, I'm an active elder at um, Hope Church, um, House of Prayer, for everyone in Clarksburg, Maryland. And um, lastly, a founder of Red Alpha. So we're celebrating our 10th year anniversary uh, for uh, the company um, this year. And um, really it's, uh, it's about the, the core of who I am and where my dad kind of raised me um, the way I am um, to really be um, bold, uh, bold about things and you know, not to be satisfied uh, with the status quo. And what where that, you know, hit um, is I, I graduated college. I tried many different businesses and they all failed. And I learned uh, wonderful lessons from all of them. Um, but it wasn't until it hit me, you know, just kind of like smacked me in the face. Like, hey, maybe I should do something in an area that I'm really um, an expert in, right? Which was software development, right? And so started um, uh, Red Alpha um, after having been really, I guess frustrated, right? So frustrated with the common Department of Defense, you know, contractor landscape and how, you know, um, you know, it, it ends up being if you have a clearance and a pulse, you know, it's a, a butts and seeds kind of mentality. And and I got really frustrated with that. And I felt like uh, West Coast startup innovation, you know, highly disruptive, agile development was a much better method of doing delivery of software. And I felt like the government sorely needed it. And, um, you know, so the experiment was really the hypothesis of, hey, the government needs this. And, you know, the government would recognize the value in this. And so that's why we started um, Red Alpha um, to, to really capture that hypothesis. Okay. Yeah, congratulations on your 10 years as well. That's quite impressive. So as you look back on your 10 year journey, I mean, obviously, you're, you've got a critical mission that is important uh, as it pertains to the federal government and other companies that are interested in secure information and secure data. But um, what would you tell the, uh, you know, Daniel Ra 10 years ago? Uh, what have you learned over the last 10 years? Or what what's what would you tell a new startup that's trying to get into the market today? Hmm. Well, so one thing I recognize in my 10 year journey that I hadn't realized, and it's really after having gone through it that I realized it, is that, um, you know, you always feel like you have something of value, right? And I felt like I had something of value, um, a delivery, a methodology, you know, quality and things like that. Um, but it, it wasn't until I really understood empathy for the customer mm -hmm. that I was able to make a difference you know and and what I bring as value is not only what's is not always what's required or even sought after as value 
Um, so I come to realize now, 10 years later, it's like, you know, there's a reason why a lot of different business models exist and uh, they all have a place, you know, in, in the scheme of, um, you know, business and opportunity. So um, what I thought was, you know, tremendous value, I, I've, you know, changed my methodology and thinking about that because you know, customers aren't always looking for it. I mean, let's say you're building a home, right? And you're delivering a $5 million home when they're only looking for a, you know, $200,000 home. Uh, quality doesn't matter at that point, right? You know, the, the excess quality is an excess, right? So you're really not understanding your customer, right? Um, and so that's been probably the biggest thing. If I knew earlier on, you know, a better um, understanding of empathy, I think I could have, you know, done things a little bit better. Wow, that's a powerful um, insight that you have, knowing the voice of the customer, paying attention to what the customer uh, uh, feels is valuable, right? One of the statements that I make a lot is that as companies um, create more value, they become more valuable. And mm -hmm. a lot of that is in the eyes of the customer. When the customer sees you as valuable uh, to their needs, meeting, meeting what they want, then they're going to reach out uh, in true mm -hmm. partnership form. So that's that's outstanding. You know, you have a, a, a great corporate culture that you've built over the years as well in your 10 years at Red, Red Alpha. Mm -hmm. I know that you have uh, worked diligently around your core values and, and shared values among your team members. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those core values that you highlight and uh, why was that so important to you? Yeah, so um, so a lot of our you know core values and company culture are biblical based principles, right? There's things that I've learned, you know, just kind of you know studying and reading um, the Bible and you know in my own personal time, and um, you know uh, come to understand through business books and, and things like that. But they all you know are very um, in alignment um, with each other, and so. The reason why um, culture and core values is important is, you know, probably the hardest thing, you know, for me um, is, you know, inspiring change when no one is looking, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do you inspire change um, and have an effect of change when no one's looking, no one's, you know, checking, right? And so the only way you can do that is, you know, fundamentally um, adapting at, at your core. Right. And maybe that's why they call it core values. Right. But every company has core values. So my thought has always been, OK, well, if every company has core values and we can all agree that there are many companies that we don't want to do work with, well, then is core values is enough. Is that strong enough? Is that going to really make a difference? And, you know, my thought is it, it doesn't. You know, so so many of the companies that you know I, um, I came out to you know differentiate against, they all had wonderful core values, and, and yet the culture and and all the things that you know we, we love and hate about companies, they they were still expressed. So, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create habits, right? Core values are great, you know, to put on a wall. Um, but they don't really make a difference. So what we're trying to do is create habits. Um, so we have habitual things, you know, rituals that, that we go through that are um, strongly tied to cadence, right? So weekly, daily, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, behavioral things. You know, how can a core value be turned into a behavior through repetition, through habits and things like that? I love the idea of core habits rather than core values, right? Uh, because you really are talking about behaviors. Can you, I know you have quite a, an exhaustive and extensive list of core habits that you've developed. Can you share a few of your favorites? Uh, yeah, probably my favorite is uh, the one we all struggle with and we're all trying to get better at, which is check the ego at the door. Mm. Um, so, you know, that, that's a core value, you know, behavior that we have that, you know, we, every time that comes up, you know, everyone just sits there and goes, mm, 
you know, because we can all reference and think about the last time, you know, we came into a room and we didn't check our ego at the door. You know, and we, we've been fortunate enough at Red Alpha to have a lot of subject matter experts, right? A lot of subject matter experts in lots of different domains, you know, in software and cybersecurity and, you know, intelligence analysis. So when you are a subject matter expert, you are a subject matter expert. It's really hard not to have some type of ego. But the wonderful thing about our people is that, you know, we are all um, on a lifelong journey uh, to continuously check our ego at the door. You know, we walk into a conference room and, you know, titles and everything is stripped away, right? It's, you know, we are people that have an opinion and we're going to figure out what's the best thing to do for the customer, right? So sometimes, you know, we love it when people flip the table because they're so like adamant about like, wow, this is such the right thing, you know, but it really has to be founded on the principle of what's best for the customer, right? And you can't do that if you have an ego. Um, so we try our best, you know, we don't always succeed, but we're in a, like a lifelong journey, like I said, and most of our behaviors are that way. You know, nobody in the company exhibits them all, you know, but we exhibit enough to kind of be, you know, okay with each other. Um, and then we're all on the pursuit. Well, I think that's what good habits and good uh, values are all about, right? They're, they're aspirational in nature. They're what we aspire to doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that we're excellent on them every single day, but we try to get better. And that's part of the, the lifelong, lifelong journey that we're on as leaders is that, um, you know, we're just constantly sharpening the saw so that hopefully yesterday we're better than yesterday and, and tomorrow will be better than today. Right. So mm -hmm. I love that. And I love to check the ego at the door, you know, it really speaks to servant leadership and, and, um, understanding that, uh, uh, you know, I talk about the importance of teachability. Uh, good, good employees, good leaders understand that they should always be teachable. And um, one of the problems that many businesses have, as you know, and many leaders have, is when we when we get to that place that we we think we've figured it all out, everything changes in our world, and we end up getting left behind. And that's why it's it's important to continue to have that. I may be an expert but I still got to continue to learn and grow and develop. And there's probably many areas in my life that I'm not an expert on. And so I need, right. I need the help of other experts in those areas in order to help me to succeed. Hey, I know yeah, actually right. our core value is servant leadership, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got five core values and servant leadership is one of them. Um, it's just hard to, to be servant leader, you know, be a servant leader, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's like, being a servant leader requires us to do many things, right? So, yeah, I love it. Um, now, I love that you're a technology company and the values that you just talked about um, have been established. Many of your values um, have a spiritual nature to them. Can you tell me a little bit about your faith journey and, and how you've integrated and why you chose to integrate some faith components into your spirit, into your uh, core values or core habits? <laughs> Yeah, as a, kind of as a roundabout answer to that, you know, part of our vision is to, um, you know, going back to my, you know, my dad's kind of journey, right? Um, you know, we say that we're fighting to create a safe place for generations of Americans, right? Which include my children and hopefully my children's children, right? And that's really what my dad did when he came to the U.S., right? Um, then we also talk about Red Alpha, you know, does that by fighting for others the way that we'd want to be fought for, right? And our weapons are digital transformation and technology enablement through software solutions, you know, but if you peel that back, you know, fighting for others the way that we'd want to be fought for, you know, that's really an adaptation of our own uh, version of the golden rule, right? That comes from the Bible, uh, which you know, do to others as you'd want to uh, want them to do to you right and so that concept is um, not really a, a religious concept it's not a christian concept right it's really a you know worldly recognized concept that you know no matter who you are if you treat other people with respect you know you might get some respect back i mean it's it's tried and true so you know we have lots of those kinds of you know very common um, business value principles um, that, that do have a source, you know, back to, 
uh, biblical principles. So, you know, many years ago, I, I, I've, I've read, you know, every business book out there, right? Um, and I used to study them a lot. And, and I just found them to be um, very surface level, right? You know, they may say the right thing, but then there's no like core fundamental reason why that exists or, you know, core fundamental reason why, you know, there's a value there. It's just they've hit on a, a surface level, you know, piece of it. And then they create a book out of it, right? But then if I tie it back and, you know, when after I um, just kind of stopped reading all business books and I went to um, just kind of studying the Bible, I, I found that, you know, many of the same things were being talked about. And so, um, you know, although it's not a, you know, Red Alpha is not a Christian company, right? You know, but um, my influences do come from the Bible, right? And the, come from my, my own spiritual journey about doing what's right. You know, and that's that's just fundamental good human human nature. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I think, you know, I was on that same similar journey, um, looking at a lot of business books and understanding that um, really the wisdom that they were espousing, whether they knew it or not, and sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't, really came out of the foundational principles that are in the Bible. And uh, and so, you know, uh, for for leadership purposes, sometimes I think it's easy or better to go back to the source, right? Uh, uh, and or find out what what are those principles that should be guiding our life and, and guiding our business, and and seeing that they've been proven that they that they work, just like the golden rule is a is a is a great example of uh, a, a business principle that um, a, that's biblical in nature. But yet, it, it's worked in every business that it's ever been it's ever been implemented. So, mm -hmm. I know that you, um, uh, your faith really uh, motivates you, and I know that you're very transparent about your 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 own personal values and how that helps you to shape decisions. And I, I think that also um, garners the respect of our team. They may differ with us, or may they may have a different idea or concept, but they, I think. What I've always seen is that teams and, and other people respond to people that have strong uh, cores and strong centers. Do you find that to be the case as well? That I mean, I know you're you're sensitive to respect of all individuals, but that uh, they also respect you as a leader because they know where you're coming from. Yeah, I think so. Uh, absolutely. Then, uh, you know, because we, we have people of, you know, all shapes and sizes, religious, political backgrounds, you know, um, you name it, you know, we have uh, somebody in the company that, um, you know, has that belief, right? So, you know, we, you know, we don't, um, you know, express it, you know, in, in an overt way, but, you know, I'm also not shy about like my own personal faith, right? And in my journey. And so that's, it's, it's been, it's been well received so far, you know, occasionally somebody will say like, Hey, you know, I'm this, and I, I don't really believe that. Right. But then, um, you know, if we talk about it, the core fundamental, we agree with, you know, they just, you know, they just may not uh, agree with a scriptural verse. Right. But they have their own quote, you know, which is very similar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can just remove, um, the fact that it comes from the Bible, uh, we all agree that it's, it's still a good principle. So, um, and, and then, you know, I, I think it also helps, like, when I'm transparent, it helps other people to, you know, uh, be transparent about their core fundamental belief, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so why is it that you want to treat the customer that way or your teammate that way? Mm -hmm. You know, if we can find those things, those core fundamental beliefs, then we start to unpack assumptions, right, and remove assumptions, and then we can come together as a team. Because ultimately, as a team, you know, there has to be transparency and no barriers to, um, you know, coming together and working. You know, we have to um, remove all assumptions. So in that respect, I think it's helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I'm in a minority group of, of people <laughs> that doesn't mind being transparent about everything, right? <laughs> uh, I'm, we, we work in a sector of, um, you know, the economy where... Um, you know, transparency is not really as as easy to do, right? So it's it's something we're all trying to be better at. Well, I think it is an interesting dichotomy for people in your industry as well, both the technology, but also the 
the cybersecurity and the, the uh, private um, secure data transfer of information, you know, I, I tell leaders today that people connect, employees especially, connect with leaders who exhibit authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. And authenticity is the highest traded value today of all of all leadership traits because people will, you know, they may have a different concept, a different idea, but when they know that the leader is, is authentic in who they are, then that inspires inspires a team and it leads them yeah. and it challenges them to think about well why is the leader so convicted in that particular uh, case so I love your authenticity but also your uh, transparency and your um, respect for all people hey I got a couple uh, topics that I wanted to hit on with you because um, okay. they're kind of what's going on in the world right now when we talk about respect for for all individuals, and I know that you have a high high value of respect. Obviously, you've seen what's been happening in the Asian American culture, where there's been random attacks on on um, people of all ages, but um, even elderly um, men and women um, for what well, looks like no apparent reason. I know that that deeply, or I would ima imagine that deeply impacts you. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it what it was like uh, for you just to be uh, trying to be an Asian American CEO, and then maybe um, how how that recent event has impacted you personally? Yeah, thanks thanks for asking. Um, so this has been a journey for myself, and you know many um, other Asian Americans that I've talked to, right? Where you know we've kind of uh, you know generationally, you know, come to the United States and just kind of figured it out, right? You know, if, if there's a challenge, if there's a goal, if there's a, you know, a, a principle, then, you know, we live by it. And then, you know, we try our best to overcome it, right? And um, it, it's hit me really hard uh, recently, all this, this stuff that's been going on in the news, when for the first time, I realized that, you know, there are limitations, you know, they, like, I, I really, um, in the U.S., you know, having grown up, you know, I've experienced prejudice. I've experienced racism. Yes, absolutely. But I never really thought of myself as um, any different, you know, than anyone else. You know, I, I never really thought of any, you know, uh, myself as being different from, you know, from any other, you know, race or, or color or ethnicity. Um, but for the first time recently, I've been realizing based on, you know, some statistics and things that I've learned and you know come to uh, awareness myself that there are limitations you know and and when there's limitations that means that i am different right? <laughs> it's like i was like looking at the mirror for the first time um and it's only when i think about not myself but i think about my kids mm -hmm. my children and my children's children that i um i start to wonder you know if that's okay and how will they, you know, be treated or how, you know, what will the environment be when they grow up? Will it be better or will it be worse, right? You know, and my hope is that um, one step better is all I can ask for, right? And one step better for my children, you know, and one step better for their children. Um, and, and what can I do to help uh, influence that, right? Um, so, you know, it, it may sound, you know, really, you um, not a big deal or a first world problem, but, you know, as a, a founder of a company, uh, as an executive in a company, um, the statistic that, you know, hit me um, based on that uh, position is, you know, there's very rarely any um, Asians in a executive board um, at a large company. Uh, so, you know, occasionally you'll see a CEO or, um, you know, chief executive, but very rarely on the boards of any of these companies. And so that, you know, I'd always heard people talk about the bamboo ceiling and things like that, but just kind of really recognize that. And then I was like, well, that's okay for me because, you know, again, if there's a goal and there's an obstacle, like I just fight around it, right? And that's part of why I started Red Alpha, right? Is to be more in control of my destiny and, you know, be able to do what I think is uh, fundamentally the right thing, you know, um, and, but then if I think about my kids, I think about like, well, well, they have the same 
you know, opportunity and method. Maybe they want to be uh, an executive at, at a big company and not start their own thing. You know, will they be able to do that? You know, will, would they be able to be, you know, um, in politics and, you know, get to Congress or, you know, be the president, right? Are those things possible, right? Um, so just looking the way that I look and looking the way that my children look, you know, I just started questioning, you know, that. Um, and, and it's it's really not a, um, a struggle, more as like, you know, how can I influence things so, you know, we can all, you know, kind of love each other, love our neighbor, you know, regardless of how we look. So I, I'm in a journey, you know, I'm in the, the beginning stages of a journey, um, getting awareness, learning about my own, you know, Asian American history and um, things like that. And um, it's been, it's been, for me, exciting. You know, because despite of whatever is going on, the fact that it's uh, being covered at all is, you know, a, a step forward. Uh, the fact that people are recognizing and having conversations is a step forward. Um, you know, even within our own um, you know, CXP retreat, um, you know, a couple months ago, you know, I shared a case study about this uh, racial reconci re reconciliation concept. Uh, and then my struggle with it. And, um, you know, the group members, uh, you know, some people were like, whoa, I've never been on the other side of that, right? Um, um, oh, I didn't even realize that was going on, right? There was a lot of, um, oh, I didn't know, you know, and the fact that we had awareness was awesome. And then the fact that um, I experienced ra racial um, embracement, right? You know, which is maybe past reconciliation or on the way to reconciliation. You know, um, um, a Caucasian person, a black person, and you know, males and females. You know, they all embraced me and said, "Hey, I hear you, Daniel. You know, we're not going to just send you out there on your own to fight. We're going to fight with you. You know, we're going to be together on this. You know, and I got to experience for the first time what I think many people haven't experienced, no matter what color you are, cross racially. You know, uh, an, an embracement." And I, I wish I could bottle that up, you know, and just kind of share it with people so they can experience, um, you know, one step forward, right? You know, and I'm, and I'm trying to figure out how I can do that, you know, how I can uh, facilitate that. Well, I, I, love, um, I love that message of, of ra racial embracement, ra racial reconciliation. You know, the Bible tells us that um, there's no partiality with God. God loves uh, people of every nation and race and creed and color and we're all going to be in heaven together uh, celebrating for all eternity and you know I do think that we need to practice more of that here on on earth and, and in businesses um, as well so um, I, I do um, I am bothered by the um, the attacks you know anytime hatred happens in our country as a as an, as an awareness moment and a wake-up call and hopefully um, uh, this can create some awareness around uh, racial um, reconciliation uh, racial uh, embracement like you were saying hey uh, let's let's talk just a little bit more about that because I do want to give some concrete potential next steps um, when we talk a lot about in, in companies and organizations and you mentioned the idea that or concept that there's not many uh, Asian Americans or, or Asians on uh, corporate boards um, uh, in, in, in larger companies and organizations. That that's that's uh, something that I believe needs to be looked at and something that needs to be be challenged. Um, but let's talk about diversity and inclusion. I know that those are words that get thrown around a lot with companies. Uh, even small companies, they they have a focus on diversity. They under many CEOs that I know understand that the the more diverse their team, the better that they can produce. Tell us how you look at diversity and inclusion, and and what would you have us to think about as, or what would you have the CEOs that might listen to this think about as it pertains to sp potentially uh, the Asian Americans that or in their circle of influence um, should 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 be um, something that is specifically focused on or, or how would you define diversity? Yeah, thanks for asking. So um, 
somewhat of an interesting concept in my mind, right? So if, if you go to any fine dining restaurant or if you go to your kitchen, right? You know, there's, you know, a lot of seasoning, right? So, you know, I like to think of it as, you know, a, a maturity level and a road to maturity, right? Um, one thing that I've learned over time is um, nothing in life and especially not in business is about checking boxes, right? It's about checking the box and then checking the next, the next, next box, right? So it's about maturity and growing in what you're doing as opposed to, hey, you know, I hired one person who's something, so I checked the box, right? There's this maturity level that we all have to seek, right? And so I think it's fascinating and it's great that uh, diversity, diversity and inclusion is being talked about a lot more, you know, all across the board, you know, but, you know, going back to my kitchen concept, you know, right now it's really about salt and pepper, right? It's really about black and white, right? So that becomes more of the diversity, right? salt and pepper but my statement is there's a lot of other spices in the rack right now do we get to all those spices in the rack immediately no i mean you got to kind of start with the basics right so you know if you are an organization that's predominantly you know um, white or male white you know then it'd be great for you know a woman it'd be great for you know a, a black person it'd be great for all these other things to happen but then once you get to that point, you know, just kind of continue on that path, right? You haven't just checked the box. Oh, I use salt and pepper and I'm done, right? There's so many other spices, you know, on the rack. And let's treat this as a journey to maturity, to being a better and better chef, right? You know, you're not going to go to um, a fine dining restaurant. I, I would hope not, you know, for the second time, if they're only using salt and pepper, right? You would want there to be an exploration, you know, exploration of dynamic things. And when they come together, it's beautiful, right? It's beautiful in a different way. Um, so it's a tricky subject. It's a tricky thing because, um, you know, I also have a lot of empathy for my, you know, white males, right? Where, you know, you get a lot of pressure because, you know, you're seen predominantly in a lot of places and maybe there isn't a lot more diversity, you know, and I know so many, you know, so many, you know, white male brothers who are trying really hard to do the right thing, you know, and, and, and hopefully right some wrongs that happened generationally ago, right? You know, and you, it's not really your fault. So I have empathy for all humankind, right? You know, and, and if you were to go to South Korea, I'm sure you would experience racial, you know, um, hatred, you know, if you're a certain color, you know, and you don't look Korean or you don't speak the language, right? So it's not a, a skin thing to me, right? It's really, as my pastor talked about, you know, early on when all this uh, rise in Asian hate crime was happening and, and uh, what, you know, he mentioned it was, it's not about skin, it's about sin, right? It's about, you know, just, just having fear and, you know, hatred and, you know, hatred slash fear, you know, for things that are unfamiliar, right? And not taking the time to get to know something. You know, because once a face and a name gets put to something, it, then it's usually hard to, to do those things that you're doing or contemplating, right? Um, but, you know, it's, so it's a complex thing. Uh, but my hope is that, you know, diversity and inclusion would continue, right? It would continue and get to the next level of maturity and the next level of maturity. And so, you know, for good, better or worse, um, with the rise in awareness for Asian Americans, you know, my hope is that the next layer is, you know, Asian Americans being brought to the table for more diversity and inclusion, um, you know, and it's, it goes beyond the traditional, right? Okay, let's be real, like, you know, a lot of people that are, you know, that look like me, maybe they're good at math, right? You know, maybe they're good at science, right? Um, so, you know, you give them a pass to go into those kinds of fields of study and things, but what about the other areas, right? I mean, I'll go on record, you know, um, you know, to say like, okay, well, I know a lot of Asian brothers and sisters that are good at sports, but I don't see them in sports. You know, is it because that we, you know, we're not good at sports? I mean, if you look at the Olympics, you know, there are lots of Asian countries that win Olympics, you know, and gold medals. So what is it? Why is it that Asian Americans can't rise to the occasion in the U.S.? I mean, there's a bit of discrimination there too, right? I've experienced it myself, right? Where, okay, maybe I'm not that good at basketball, 
but I know I was much better than at least one of those guys that made it on the team. Right. Right. But I didn't make it on the team, you know? So I, it's. Right. I think you're talking about, you know, I love, I love the idea of, and the visual that you have around the spices on the rack. Right. And, you know, part of the, I think the secret to diversity and inclusion is having an awareness of what is our standards or what do we typically go to? What spice do we typically go to? And, you know, awareness of, hey, let's try a different spice. Let's, let's be intentional and focus on, um, you know, thinking outside the box and thinking creatively and innovatively here. And then really it comes down to, just as you were talking about the sports, it comes down to the person because each person uh, has gifts and talents and abilities and, we really need to start looking at people as people and not just automatically seeing all the things that are, you know, our perception of them, but understanding each person as, as unique. And, and I know that takes time and it takes effort, but, but I've found in companies that really uh, value diversity and value um, individuals, um, they find that they can uncover the, the gifts and the talents of those, of those people of all different race and nationalities and then the performance of the company uh, goes up because um, the individual is performance has gone up because they're working in their giftedness they're working in their passions they're working in their talents so hey thanks for sharing that insight because i love the idea of more spices on the rack right and uh, you know probably yeah, and, you, and you brought up an interesting point one of the practical things that we've been talking about internally is you know um, even the applications right that we get right so you know what is the um what is the ethnical racial you know makeup look like for people that are applying to work at red alpha right um you know does it look a certain way if it looks a certain way you know why is that is that because we're only looking at certain watering holes mm -hmm. right so hey there's a lot of antelope in that watering hole and you know so we're constantly going to that watering hole so we're only getting antelopes right um, so are there other watering holes out there, you know, and if we're not exploring them, then, you know, we kind of end up with what we end up with. Right. So, um, it's a tricky thing because, you know, I, I would love to hire everyone that we could. Right. You know, I, I mean, you and I have talked about this before. I mean, we just have a heart for people, right. You know, and we would love to, you know, help people in their career progression, all people, you know, all people that come, right? right. Um, we just don't have that much work and that much, you know, ability to, to do that across the board for everyone. But in a perfect world, I would love to um, be able to hire everybody, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a progression. You know, we don't have the answer yet either, um, but at least we're trying, we're exploring, we're thinking um, about why we come to certain answers. Mm -hmm. I do think it's important right now, though, and, and I agree, and, and I know you have a heart uh, for people, and I love, like I said, the visual that you've you've created. I do think right now is a great time for for business owners and the CEOs to and CEOs to, you know, communicate the value of, of of people and that we understand their differences and but we appreciate differences and and you know we we um, care just about much as about the people as we do about the work. And, and even not, if not more about the people, because we know that um, when people are cared for and people are loved and people are seen, then we know that they're going to produce at their highest level. Hey, speaking of the news, I, I have to talk to you about this latest uh, story that just came out um, with the Colonial Pipeline and, and how the hackers got into uh, that company. I, I know, uh, you know, you, you work in a very secure environment and there's a lot of things you can't say, but... Um, what would you uh, in, encourage businesses uh, all across the country to think about as it pertains to cybersecurity or mm -hmm. securing their own uh, pathways mm -hmm. to make sure that they're not um, exposed as we've seen as as colonial was as an example yeah it's that's an interesting question um so in our company we've talked long about the fact that in lots of different areas, right? In not only in cybersecurity, but in data science, you know, machine learning, AI, in all of these, you know, areas and, 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 and things that we do, 
sometimes just doing the basics is like you know what you need to get done and so it's just surprising how how many um, companies and individuals uh, don't have the basics right you go out to ride a bike you put a helmet on right you know is that going to prevent everything no i mean but it's the basics right so you, you got to really treat cyber as a threat vector that you know um, you need to have the basics right so just like simply having an antivirus you know there's lots of companies that don't have that a lot of devices that don't have that. a lot of individuals that don't have that you know but the approach that we take uh, which you know is somewhat self-serving but you know we we take the approach of you know being consultants and you know providers to help you analyze the situation so I don't go into a, um, an organization or a company thinking like, hey, I need to sell you this like Norton antivirus. Yeah, I'm making stuff up because yeah. we don't sell it. <laughs> but, you know, I don't go in thinking that. It's really about like looking at it, looking at your landscape and then figuring out like which are the basic holes that you need to plug, right? Same thing with software, right? Same thing with um, any kind of um, force multiplying solution. You know, what are the basics and the fundamentals uh, because I think too many times, um, listening to books and podcasts and all of these experts, you try to like go and do stuff, but it's like your foundation is not set, and you know you're you're adding all this stuff onto this like foundation that's really weak. And then I mean we know what happens when that when, when that's the case, right? It becomes a brittle infrastructure. It becomes a brittle uh, solution that you can't even maintain. You don't even know what's going on with that thing anymore, right? You know, let alone that foundation is weak and it's not going to serve you well over time. So we try to take more of the uh, consultative approach. Let's, you know, figure out what's going on in your system, in your organization, you know, and then what are the basic things that need to get done, right? And is that it? You know, some people can get by with just the basics. Uh, if you're a much more complicated you know, organization, then you need to go beyond the basics, but... Um, I think just getting to the basics is really important because uh, commodities, uh, energy, um, our infrastructure, I mean, we all remember the toilet paper crisis of 2020, right? You know, the world is going to go crazy when they can't have something, you know, and, and my good friend used to tell me all the time, we're only five days away from catastrophe at any given moment. Right. He would always tell me that, Daniel. We're only five days away from a catastrophe. He's like, you know, you don't get water for five days. Yeah. You don't get toilet paper for five days. And we saw what happened then. <laughs> we survived that. But now we're getting into the same thing with gas, you know, and it's, you know, fear, fear is a very strong motivator, right? You know, and the appearance of fear is a, a strong motivator. Back to your cybersecurity question. You know, we have one, you know, one of our guys, um, you know, used to work as a risk officer, right? You know, and, you know, he would tell me, hey, um, you know, at, as a risk officer, right? You know, you, you kind of know your place in the world, right? When executives get around the table and they talk about, you know, funding or how execution of programs and things like that. And, and risk and cyber falls into risk, you know, ends up being like the leftover, right? So when all is well, that's okay. You know, but then as soon as, you know, something happens and it's like, okay, well, why didn't we have this or that or that? So you have to build into your budget, you know, early, you know, what are those things that are important enough where you build into your budget? It's not an aftermath like thought. It's not a, Hey, I got ransomware. Now I need to come up with money. You know, you have to build something into your budget right. um, and then have that turn into, you know, solutions um like a helmet you know that you're going to put on every time you go out to ride your bike well i think good business is about mitigating risk right and so whether it's the risk of losing a customer or whether it's the list of uh, risk of losing data or or um you know the risk of um, a piece of equipment going down every every business has a potential risk and the best businesses are stewards of what they have. They're analyzing the risk that's that's potential, prioritizing those risks, and then working to mitigate that risk as much as possible. We know we can't. I mean, we live in a risk-filled world. There's always something new that's unexpected or 
are changing, but the best companies are the ones that are you know, trying to mitigate those risks as much as possible so that they can continue to function um, in spite of what might happen around them or in the world in which they're which they're operating. So I love the idea of you know we're five days away from does it not in a positive way, but but it's an awareness piece, right? It's, that we're yeah that we it's an uh, awareness yeah, and that that's the other piece of it, right? Is um, if somebody wanted to get in, they're going to get in. That's just kind of the truth of the, the world we live in. If some, it, you know, it's you have a wallet, right? You know, if a pickpocket wanted that wallet, they're gonna get that wallet, right? Yeah. It, that I think that's the risk mitigation, like truth that we have to understand. If somebody wanted to get in and do something, they could, right? Yeah. Uh, defensive is it, defense is always a harder game, yeah. right? And but you know, the more obstacles you do set up, the harder it is. For they might pick somebody else rather than, you know, and I'm not. Hundred <laughs> percent, exactly. Right. Yeah, the you remember those uh, security signs on your front lawn? You don't see them as much anymore, but you know they used to be on all the signs, you know. And I know a lot of my friends didn't have that security system, but it was good enough. Like right. somebody would go, "Oh man, I just don't want to bother with that one." Right. That's human nature too. We're all lazy, right? <laughs> so we can use that to our advantage, you know. Put up one or two obstacles That's just right. enough to to kick that lazy factor in right um your mantra and i know we're almost out of time but i've got a couple of quick questions for you your mantra which i love is bringing digital transformation to the fight uh can you explain that a little bit more you mentioned it earlier in our conversation but what does that mean and, and how does red alpha do that yeah so part of why we came up with the name red alpha was we wanted this military connotation right? Um, go in behind enemy lines, you know, go, go airlift over or, you know, under and blow stuff up and move to the next thing. You know, that's the, the kind of connotation we wanted from a, from an attitude perspective, right? And so, you know, we carried that through to, you know, um, bringing digital transformation to the fight, right? You know, we wanted some, um, we wanted an attitude where, you know, for our customers, we're going to fight, right? And we're going to fight with everything that we have so that they can be, you know, overwhelmingly victorious, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the, the culture and the DNA and the attitude that we have. Um, and that's part of what has helped us get to where we're at to today, right? Because you can't have that kind of view uh, while also having a really big ego, right? Because one thing that served us really well, and this is kind of an expansion of, of this concept, early on day one, my our guys used to get tired of me saying this, you know, and I so I've toned it down a little bit and I've changed it to the to the saying that you just described. But early on, I would say, you know, if anyone our any one of our clients had a problem, right? They wanted us to clean the toilet. We would say, give us the toothbrush and we'll clean it. Right. You know, and so packed into that statement is in that model or that vision is no matter what you need to get done, you know, we're going to get it done. If right now your problem is a dirty toilet, you know, we'll go and clean that dirty toilet. Right. Because if you've been in the military, you've cleaned dirty toilets. Right. If you've done anything, you know, it's, and, and that really is about taking care of um, the group right? Not just your own, but the group for the benefit of the group, the greater good for your customer. Um, and so I've adapted that a little bit to uh, something that, you know, is a little bit easier um, on the spirit, but that we still live by that, you know, give us the toothbrush and we'll clean the toilet. And every time we've done that, I mean, we've, we've ended up that customer has become our, you know, trusted it trusted you know engagement right and we become their trusted advisor right because um, we're not just looking for like what we enjoy doing you know we don't exist because we're trying to exercise our own career enjoyment uh, we exist because you need us and if you need us you know there's nothing beneath us right you know right. we're willing to do whatever it takes uh, so that whatever it takes really turned into bringing digital transformation to the fight. 
Uh, well, I love the mantra. I think it's very empowering and very both uh, encouraging to your team, I'm sure, but also to your customers because they are looking, I'm sure, for, for a company that's going to fight for them or fight with them. And that's what your, what your mantra is really uh, describing. And I love that attitude of, hey, we're going to do whatever we can to, to help meet the customer's needs, right? And give us whatever, we'll take it, and we're going to try to find the best solution to, to really fulfill what your, des, what your desire is. I, hey, I know you're a premier government contractor at the moment that you work um, with a lot of uh, government agencies, specifically with the three-letter agencies and so on and so forth. What's the vision for Red Alpha? Where do you, where do you see Red Alpha going in the next 10 years? Hmm. And that's, that's uh, interesting. I mean, so, so definitely we want to be the market leader in a couple of different areas, right? Um, our company is all about data. You know, we help process data. We build solutions around processing data. We analyze it. We extract intelligence. We, you know, help strategy be underpinned by data. You know, it's all about data. But if we, if we think about the different, you know, kind of domains of, you know, intelligence, cyber, and um, you know, data, um, processing data. Uh, we want to be a market leader, you know, in, in those areas, uh, being able to exploit data uh, to the fullest extent. Mm. You know, but uh, beyond that, you know, in the next 10 years, maybe 10, 20, 30, you know, however long, uh, you know, we can continue to thrive. I mean, we want to we want to figure out, you know, how do we bring this attitude and this fight um, to other areas, you know, to other areas um, out there, you know, and, and we're selective in the areas that we, you know, uh, consider to go and fight for. Um, but my hope and my dream is that, you know, we'll be able to expand beyond some of the types of work that we do um, and really giving back to the community, creating some uh, greater good, right? So I'm um, you know, I'll take, for example, uh, one of my closest friends, you know, my, my best friend, he's, he's um, doing missions out in Thailand, right, you know, and he helps with um, people being rescued, you know, women being rescued, women and children being rescued from sex trafficking, and, you know, creating a sustainable living uh, for them, right, um, and he and I have always, you know, um, you know, brainstormed about, well, you know, we're a tech company, so we have tech uh, understanding. Well, there's a world market out there, you know, and there's certain third world countries and, you know, out there that could benefit from having exposure to a worldwide market, right? Where a sustainable living can be created and they don't have to go and be brought and dropped or, you know, pulled into um, something that they don't want to be involved in, right? So a technology company helping to influence that, you know, being a part of a incubation and a startup culture where we can take people that are rescued from the depths of poverty um, to generational um, freedom, you know, generational breakthrough, um, you know, generational wealth, you know, that would be really satisfying, you know, uh, beyond. And, and I think that still reigns true to, um, our core theme, which is, you know, uh, protecting this nation, uh, creating a safe space and a place for my children and my children's children to thrive. You know, that's really what it's about. So when we say we're protecting this country, we're doing, you know, intelligence, you know, um, type stuff, um, then it's really about creating a safe space in the U.S., you know, for this nation so that we can thrive, um, you know, whether it's, you know, external pressures on, on the nation or whether it's internal pressures, right? Like the things that we talked about, um, the, the rising hate against Asians, right? That's not creating a safe space for people here and my children and my children's children, you know, and um, I want to do right by, you know, the reason why my dad came here, right? He left you know, a very comfortable space. I mean, he was one of the top developers in Korea when there was like, you know, two computers, right? Um, you know, he would have been very rich. We would have been very well set, you know, if we stayed in Korea, but he left that 
to come here for um, you know freedom and democracy and more um, cultivating environment for his children and his children, right? I just want to be able to expand that to a broader scale for people that are not in my family, right? To fight for the nation, for it, fight for the people, the citizens of the U.S. Well, I love it. I love the vision that God's given to you. And uh, Daniel, you are indeed a well done uh, leader. Uh, people that are listening, they can learn more about your company if they go to redalpha.com on the internet. Yeah, it's red-alpha.com. And uh, so you can, they can see a little bit more about the work that you specifically are engaged in. But Daniel, hey, thank you for this conversation. It's been extremely enlightening and challenging in so many ways that you've helped us to maybe think about things a little bit uh, differently. So I'm just honored to um, continue to partner with you. And I look forward to seeing the uh, great days that you have ahead of you at Red Alpha. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for the space and the time. I appreciate it.